Tonight, I am titling the message from Daniel chapter 11, verses 36 through 45, The Willful King, and really we'll be learning about the Antichrist. And as we come into this passage, you know, one of the things that we are all well aware of, our world is clamoring for peace. You think of all the problems in the Middle East and, and Ukraine and elsewhere around the world, what is the world they're all the time offering ways of peace i mean nations like india step in and france and germany and there's there's heads of state from around the world that are constantly trying to offer peace accords and they want to be pervaded per, uh, pervaded as ones who are uh, very peaceful individuals are trying to we also are seeing throughout i mean you look at even through the Gulf and various places, how much of the time, um, like in the Red Sea area with the Houthis and the various uh, radicals that are terrorizing ships, sinking ships, missiling ships, various things of that nature, or the attempt to do those things. And what has happened? The navies from around the world, I mean, not just the United States, countries that you would never would think of are getting giving uh, transport uh, assistance to their cargo ships because the whole world is being upset in trade because of what's going on in the Middle East. What's it going to be like when God says, Satan, you can really mess things up. <laughs> um, you, can, you can really wreak some havoc on these things. You know, the world clamors for peace, but God is often absent from man's solutions for peace. And what happens? War looms over and over and over again. World War I. What was that war supposed to be called? Do you remember? It was the... The war to end all wars. And, uh, of course, we know the 20th century, the United States alone was involved in five major conflicts. Um, America has been involved in a major war averaged out every 25 years. So we have been heavily involved in some kind of warfare of that nature. And uh, even with us being as first world, peaceable, you know, that kind of, uh, those things, um, we still are in a time where we're involved in war. Do you remember when Jeremiah's time is that people were crying out, peace, peace, and there was no peace. Paul referred to an attitude in 1 Thessalonians 5.13 when he wrote, when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape, referring to the tribulation period, 1 Thessalonians 5, 3. Uh, we often just see chapter 4 as the rapture passage, but the, the entire book of 1 Thessalonians is, uh, is handling, really, has Christ come or not? And uh, it just walks us through many of the things there. You see, there's a war on in the age of man. And this war is a man's attempt to rule the world without God. And it's going to culminate eventually in the greatest of all war campaigns, Armageddon. We, we have termed it doomsday sometimes, but it is of scriptural proportions. It is a military campaign. And today I want you to think of Armageddon not as a single battle engagement, but an entire war engagement that is going to take place through the tribulation period of major epic proportions. Um, today, I want you can uh, maybe write this down, but I'm going to read a little bit of a time called Armageddon from Revelation chapter 16, verse 13 through 16. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon. Who's the dragon? It's Satan. That old serpent of old, out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. 
Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they shall gather, and they gathered them together to a place in Hebrew, Armageddon. I forgot to, you've seen that big picture of the Valley of Jezreel or Armageddon. And I have had that large poster up here in the front for Sunday school. And I could share that with you afterwards. It's a beautiful, beautiful area. Napoleon said it is one of the world's most natural battlefields that this world has ever known. And it has had something like 200 battles already on its fields. Today I want you to look in chapter 11 and just before we read this, do you remember the same, do you remember the four horsemen of Revelation in the beginning of the book? Not, not chapter 19 when Jesus comes on the scene, but the four horsemen. The first horseman, what, what kind of horse is he wearing? Wearing, riding, you know. <laughs> Yeah, Josh, the white horseman. Um, and he comes, on, is he come with a sword? I mean, is he coming ready to kill everybody? Yeah, peace through flattery. And so he comes on the scene, ushering in peace in the Middle East, and he's going to turn on Israel, as you saw in, back in chapter 9, verse 26, and around that area, where he will turn on Israel and break the covenant, and he's going to hunt and kill the people of God, the covenant people of God. Look in your Bible and your copy of God's Word, and I want you to look in beginning in verse 36 of chapter 11 in Daniel. Then the king... The king shall do according to his own will, and he shall exalt and magnify himself above every god, shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished, for what has been determined shall be done. He shall regard neither the god of his fathers nor the desire of woman, women, nor regard any God, for he shall exalt himself above all. But in their place he shall honor a God of fortresses, and a God which his fathers did not know. He shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus he shall act against the strongest fortresses with a foreign God which he shall acknowledge and advance its glory. And he shall cause them to rule over many and divide the land for gain. At the end, I'm sorry, at the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, and with many ships. He shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. He shall also enter the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape from his hand, Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. But he shall, sh but sh yeah, sorry. he shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. Also the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall follow at his heels. But news from the east and the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many and he shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end, and no one will help him. Let's pray. Lord God, would you please assist us in understanding these prophecies? Lord, you have foretold exactly the parameters in which the Antichrist will operate, and the world, and what's going on. Just as we saw in chapter 10, angels behind the scenes of the newest superpowers of the world, and those who had control over the glorious land of Israel. Lord, at the center of your plan is the apple of your eye, Israel. And Lord, you're going to keep your promises. And Lord, we thank you for even your mercy in this text. Lord, thank you for the weakness and frailty of the most superpowered nations of the world and Satan himself as he masquerades around as a satanically uh, possessed man. He operates his will. 
and pulls the strings of this man as his puppet. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be ones that fear you more than the powers that be around us in the frailty of man's foolishness. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, in this passage, I want to ask the question as I have my main proposition for you, and it's this. When men promise peace that only God can give, what should you do? This world is all the time offering quick fixes, peace offers. Who alone can give peace? And today is my main challenge for us. I want you to consider this, that um, of the, this passage that we're going through, God wants us to depend on His supremacy, His supremacy, and not our self-sufficiency. We need to be careful what the world offers because it, it's so tantalizing. Oh, I can do this and I can make I, peace happen through myself, through people through godless attempts to find peace. You will not find peace aside from Christ. And we know being justified by faith, we have peace with God. And it's, the, it's real peace. The world offers the illusion of tranquility, the offer of it, but they have no power to sustain it. And here we come into this um, section of Scripture. And my very first point is this. The Antichrist will be characterized as, number one, self-willed and antagonistic toward the supernatural. This, I get this from verses 36 through 37. And the very first thing, then the king shall do according to his own will. That's why I've titled this message, The Willful King. Um, he is called the king. Back in chapter 7, verse 8 and 24, what was he called back then? He was called the little horn. Um, he here it describes whole nations as horns, regions of the world, of the revived Roman Empire, and a, an alliance of ten uh, portions of the old revived Roman Empire that have come together in this confederacy. Yet he himself is a little horn that's going to dominate, as we saw in chapter 7, verse 8 and 24. What is he called? Turn in your Bible back to chapter 8. What is he called in Daniel 8, verse 23? <clears throat> in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, the, a king shall arise, having fierce features who understands sinister schemes. Here, he is a king of fierce countenance. He is a king who is going to use power with great ability. We know that, that the same area, the revived Roman Empire that was involved in cutting off the Messiah, having him crucified, that the, the, the revived Roman Empire, sorry, that was the Roman Empire, that a revived Roman Empire that will come out of that region, we will have a king in Daniel 9.26 who is called the prince that shall come, the prince that shall come. And we know that he's going to make a covenant, a peace treaty, of, as you said earlier, flattery with, with, um, with Israel. In verse 36, this willful king he is the antitype of, Antic of Antiochus. We've just been studying our last section, our last message. You saw how the Antiochus Epiphanes, in so many ways, pictures what the end guy, the Antichrist, is going to be like. Well, here is the Antichrist, the little horn, the prince that shall come. He is called this man of sin in 2 Thessalonians 2.3. Not only that, he's called the son of perdition. Perdition, old word, destruction. He's the son of destruction. And he is called the wicked one, 2 Thessalonians 2.8. The Antichrist in 1 John 2.22. And he is called a beast in Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. Now, notice in Daniel 11.36, over there, we see, what is he going to do? He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god. Um, here, the Antichrist 
will indeed try to set himself above every God, which is exactly what 2 Thessalonians 2.4 tells us. That he, will ascend, he is going to go into the temple of God and he's going to receive worship as God. It, he, this is an interesting thing, that all it's going to be showing here. And I'm going to walk us through this. One of the things he's also known for in Revelation 13, 6, is he's going to blaspheme God. He is going to say horrible, blasphemous things against Christianity, against Jesus the Messiah. Could you imagine in our world, you, you think of how that the world in the last few decades has turned against nations who once were ambitious at taking dominion of this world. But what does the world call it? Imperialism. And slights them as, and paints them in colors as being these horrible, heinous individual uh, nations. Yet, they were doing in many ways what God said to do. Multiply, fill the earth, and take dominion of it. Yet, they did it with greed. Yeah, sure. Uh, that's kind of a godless way of ruling. Yeah, they did things wrong and they also did some things that were right. Yet, what does our world do? Throw out whole segments of our past. The world is always looking for a new agenda in which to slight someone to advance themselves. And it's the day is going to come when it will become incredibly popular to slander Christ during the tribulation. And it's going to be heavily approved of and it's going to be led by none other than the leader of the free world of the Roman, the revived Roman Empire. Here, when he comes, this, this one with fierce countenance, this little horn, the willful king, his person will speak things against God that will be and take unique things to himself. He is a willful king. He is insolent. A great word choice. Leon Wood said that from what others will dare to speak, he's going to say things that other rulers have not dared to speak in a degree of insolence and self-exaltation. In verse, uh, in fact, it says he will speak astonishing things. New, New King James says blasphemous things against the God of God's verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 36. I do want to read uh, Revelation 13, 5 and 6. This is what the Bible says he's going to do. The beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemous things against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. There is going to be a flagrancy that Satan is going to finally have his day to speak out. He's pulling the world in a way, just almost like an atheism that is incredibly ambitious. And he takes this to a completely approved level through much of the world. And he is going to speak in these ways that other leaders have been afraid to touch. You know, a lot of our politicians are not Christians, but they all have read the Bible so they can quote a few verses now and then and win the evangelical vote. But uh, that's not going to be Antichrist. He is not buttering up to Christians after a certain point. There's going to be a turning point where he is just going to be very insolent in how that he blasphemes God's name. And he will take worship to himself. He will get others to have an idolatrous homage to him. He will, if you would, he will seek worship. Um, and those who refuse are going to be persecuted and martyred. Those that don't take the mark of the beast 666 They'll be beheaded for their faith. They'll be beheaded for their resistance. As uh, I know that you know those things already, but how far will the Antichrist go in his rebellion? Look in verse 36. There's more in that verse. It says, And the king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god and shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods and shall prosper till wrath has been accomplished. The word wrath is indignation. It's the same phrase that comes up in Daniel 8, 19. 
um, again, dealing with uh, this time period, this time of indignation or wrath will be finished. I believe the NASB has finished instead of accomplished. Both great word choices for what has been determined shall be done. Ah, but who's doing the determining? The Most High God rules over the kingdoms of the world. We learned that from chapter 4. That hasn't changed. And in, we're going to see into chapter 12 that this is all within the sovereignty of God. And you look at verse 45, and the day will happen that he will come to his end, and there's going to be no help for this insolent, blasphemous Antichrist and all that he tries to pull off. Well, in verse 36, we see that it's going to be decreed. Basically, God says there is a predetermined um, things that Satan is allowed to do, the Antichrist. He's on a leash. You, you think of Isaiah 46, 10. My counsel shall stand. I will accomplish all my purpose. God is really still in control, even though he's allowing the Antichrist to do evil things. Verse 37 what will be different about the Antichrist, though, versus Antiochus Epiphanes? Well, let's look in verse 37. He shall regard neither the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall exalt himself above all of them. This is in contrast to our previous uh, main character, Antiochus Epiphanes. What did Antiochus Epiphanes try to do to the Jewish people? He tried to Hellenize them, to be, take on Greek gods and, and open them up to other deities. But what happened? Um, he, he converted some, but there was a revolt that came up. But that is what he utilized. Now we come into the tribulation period. And the Antichrist is not going to do that. You see that in verse 37? That in verse 37, it says, He shall regard neither... And the word God we have in the New King James is singular. Uh, most uh, texts have it in the plural, the gods of his fathers. So as in the deities that have been worshipped by those in the old revived Roman Empire, the ancient Greece, the ancient world, the ancient superpowers that we've been studying all through the book, those are no longer going to be the stars of the show. Isn't it interesting? What has Satan tried to do from the very beginning? Get people to worship anyone or anything other than God. Take a piece of stone, carve up something and bow down and worship it. And he led Israel astray. And he led the world astray. But when it comes to the end, the ultimate goal is that he would be worshipped. Not God. In fact, I'm going to blaspheme the name of God is what he, the Antichrist will do. It's sickening for me to use the per first personal uh, singular, not I, okay? But it's Antichrist. That's what he's going to be so ardent against our holy God. He will have no regard for the God of his fathers. Um, the, and the gods, or the gods of his fathers, the, the, the deities. He'll also not have the desire of women. Now, what is that? Now, remember, this is Daniel writing the book. This is a very Jewish book. As he writes this, what was the great desire of women? Maybe the Messiah is coming. Maybe, maybe I can be the mother of the, the prophet of God that's to come, the servant of the Lord, the Messiah. And we know that Mary had that most often awesome privilege. And the mother of Messiah is, he is going to have no regard for Christianity or for Christ other than maybe the religious ecumenical movement of that day, the false prophet proffers off of, but um, it moves along, etc. The Antichrist will have no regard for Christ or any God. Maybe he's atheistic, and yet maybe it's sold as atheism at first, and then it's all directed to him. Maybe it's this world's really smooth moves where political leaders, hey, can we be honest? Do political leaders get worshipped right now? But isn't it so interesting? I don't know if you've ever noticed. 
We'll have presidents come into town and those who can be presidents or senators. And what happens? People flock out. But then, once the president is an ex-president, I've seen where a couple dozen people come out to see a former United States Bill Clinton when he was here. And he's come to town several times. And it's just a small showing. Why is that? He doesn't have power anymore. The Antichrist is going to have full power. And those who have the potential of more power, we've got these huge crowds for those who, who candidate for presidency and those who are president. And they bring out massive crowds because people want to be on the winning team of power. We have a thirst for power. And it's, that, that's, you know all these things. But anyhow, there'll be, he's going to be against the one beloved of women, the Messiah. Antichrist will be characterized, second point here, as trusting in his own strength alone. His own strength alone. I want you to look um, look in verse 38. But in their place, uh, what's in, in the place? Well, in the place of God's. In the place of worshiping God's. He shall honor a God of fortresses, a God which his fathers did not know. He shall honor with gold, silver, and precious stones and pleasant things. Doesn't that sound like today? I mean, that is so our day and age. And that's not to say that it can happen now, but it, but it would make total sense if we're in that day and age when this is about to happen. But what is he going to do? He's like, instead of regarding other deities or the Messiah, in their place, notice the contrast, verse 30, 38, but in their place, in contrast to all the deities and Jesus in the world, you know what we're going to do? going to be all about fortresses it's about military might it's about flexing our power i know i'm kind of a military junkie but i love watching things about advances in military things in military times this that and the other i've got a whole bunch of defense news i've got those that come up on my my phone and with the navies of the world the united states navy and chinese navy and russia's navies in their advance and the, and the newest aircraft carry for the uk and all these different things they're always touting and you know what they're always doing what is it do you know what they're generally doing on most of those videos we call it saber rattling you ever notice that on the end of some of those videos, they will use some weird one phrase saying, it's an idiom from uh, the foreign country we're trying to intimidate. They use all these little, there's these inside messages all the time given, and we're called saber rattling to tell you basically, we are the biggest guy in the block, you, you go away. And as, Militaries build up their fortresses, if you would. Verse 38, the God of fortresses. Metaphorical way of saying the Antichrist is going to have an unquenchable thirst for power, military might, a quest to be able to rule through military domination and world domination. He is going to, but also notice, he's going to have the money to do it. He's going to have resources and reserves of gold, silver, and precious stones. He is going to be filthy rich. He's the revived Roman Empire. Do you think that's possible for Europe and the revived Roman Empire to be able to pull off something like that? Is there money there? Well, not to say it's happening anytime soon, but we know it's going to happen in this day. When the day when the Antichrist is on the scene after the, the, his peace treaty has been made. Notice verse 39, a foreign God. This foreign God is apparently the same one that he's just mentioned in verse 38. It's still military might, a God of power and military might. Um, and those who acknowledge him, what's he going to do? Cronies? You follow with me, and I'll pay you off. And that's what he does. Verse 39, look at, in that verse. Thus, he shall act against the strongest fortresses with the foreign God, a foreign God, which he shall acknowledge and advance its glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many and divide the land for what? Gain. 
Verse 38, gold, silver, precious stones. Verse 39, for gain. If you work with me, it'll pay off. You know, it's interesting. Do you remember those cartoons that you had to study in world history and U.S. history where you had these guys that are carving up parts of Africa and carving up parts of Europe? Those cartoons... Has that really changed? No, we're more civilized than that, of course. Uh, hold it, what's Russia trying to do right now? A um, uh, little chunk for me, a little chunk. Hey, if you agree with me, I'll give you a little something. The world is always trying to get another slice of land and power of resources, fighting for rare earth minerals, you name it. So they can, why? So they can advance more military power. Um, all that is our current world, and it's not unlikely that that will also be the case in the future. Today, I also want to th we see that they, these are the strongest fortresses, literally the strongholds of fortresses you can translate it as. The Antichrist is not going to hold back from attacking any stronghold. He is going to be a superpower par excellence. And he's going to have great effectiveness. And he puts his reliance in his war machine. And uh, that is what he is pushing. And he's like, there'll be an allotment, allotment of land for you to gain if you work with me. Our enemies, it's time we... They have not been responsible enough to take care of their nation, right? They haven't used freedom. They haven't been dignified. I don't know. Do you remember... How is he going to sell everything? He's the father of lies. And he's going to deceive many. If it were possible, even the who? The elect would be deceived. And what is he going to perform? What does this say in Thessalonians 2? Lying wonders. The Antichrist is going to be able to pull off all kinds of feats in his bag of tricks to deceive the world. If it were even possible, even the elect the chosen of God, those who don't take the mark of the beast. Well, verses 30, let's see, notice, so in verses 36 through 39, have you seen the personal pronouns he, him, verse 40, now look in verse 40. At that time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. The question in verse 40, as we move into the next paragraph, we have to ask, who is the him? Well, the him, I believe, is the same of verse 36, 38, 39. It's just continuous. Who is the him? It's the Antichrist, the willful king. Now we move into verse 40. We, there's no break here. We see this, and we see something that takes place. And our point number three, the Antichrist will be characterized as three proud but for bogus reasons. He's going to be, he's going to consider him, he is going to be very proud. Let's look in verse, we just looked at verse 40. Let's start it. Let's read the whole verse. At the time of the end, okay, what is the time of the end? I drew a line in my Bible down to chapter 12, verse 1. At that time, Michael stands up. Uh, this, is, this is the same period in which it's going to close the end the tribulation period. What happens in chapter 12 in the first, the resurrection of the Old Testament saints, the end of the tribulation has happened. This is Armageddon. That is what you're looking at. Verses 40 through 45 is strongly Armageddon, the close, the time of the end. Okay, so at the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, and with many ships. And he shall enter the countries and overwhelm them and pass through. So what's going to happen here is the king of the south, um, Egypt, who has been the king of the south throughout all of chapter 11 so far? Remember the Ptolemies who came out of Egypt. Egypt has been the king of the south all the way through chapter 11. I believe it's the same case as we get into verse 40. The king of the south is going to, if you would, is going to be involved here. Notice in verse 40, at the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him. Who's him? Antichrist. 
So he is going to, King of the South, number one here on my chart. Egypt is going to attack Israel. While that happens, the king of the north is going to come down. Oh, does the world like pincer movements? I mean, what is our biggest fear right now? Can we fight two superpowers at the same time? And the United States is fervently trying to build up our, 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 our um, navy because right now, a strong navy is really where a lot of this battle is at and nuclear weapons and hypersonics and trying to stay ahead of all of the game as Russia has power and as China buys for power. Oh, and then we got Iran and North Korea. We've, there's a lot of wonderful actors out there, isn't there? So when this is all happening in our, that's what our day and age is like. We know that in this time, there's going to be some kind of Egyptian, I'm assuming this is some kind of Arab bloc that this will be Africa. We're going to actually see other African nations listed. Ethiopia is mentioned. So either North Africa or some kind of Muslim bloc that's involved here, they're going to come here at the same time, the king of the north. Who is the king of the north? All the way through uh, chapter 11. Syria was the king of the north all the way through chapter 11. They make a pincer movement on what place? The glorious land. Hasn't the entire book been revolving around one place? The glorious land? The land of Israel? Well, you look now, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, verse 40, with chariots, horsemen, and with many ships. So he's going to attack with fervor and shall enter the countries and overwhelm them and pass through. So Syria is going to have some success as they drive down this way. Antichrist is going to come on the scene next. Um, so with, I have to keep up with my notes. As we look in verse 40, we see, and we've already covered that. Um, oh, why is Antichrist going to come in here? Why do you think Antichrist is supposed to come? Who did Antichrist make a peace treaty with in 927? Israel. So if you've made an alliance with another country, what are you supposed to do? If you're part of NATO, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to keep your promise. So when 9-11 happened to the United States... Do you know what they did in the UK? They put memorials up throughout their country. They played the Star Spangled Banner. You can watch it on YouTube. That uh, the nation wept with us. They, were, they mourned, and what did they do? They sent their soldiers to fight terrorists with us. And what Canada do, and Australia do, and all these other countries in the world. We have an alliance. What has Japan wanted a stronger alliance in the last 10, 15 years? Because they're afraid of North Korea and China. We are, the world is constantly making alliances to this day. And we see that Antichrist is going to feign coming to help Israel. Now at first he's going to. He's going to come, he's going to defend them. But let's keep going, walking through these verses. And so, Egypt and Syria will storm against the Antichrist, verse 40. Antichrist is going to come as an ally of Israel. When Antichrist learns that Israel has been attacked by Egypt and Israel, he's going to appear to keep his covenant. Now, let's look at verses 41 through 43. Verse 41, And he shall also enter the glorious land. He was, who is the he? Remember, he and him is the Antichrist all the way through this section. He shall also enter the glorious land. Glorious land is Israel. Verse 16, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape from his hand. Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. Isn't that interesting? What on earth is that? That's the present day country of what? Any, you know, any of you know? Jordan. Why is God going to say, you can destroy all this, but you can't touch Jordan? Why, why is God concerned about Jordan? Do you remember? What has God said in the Olivet Discourse? Jesus said, when you hear the Antichrist turns against you, flee, right? Don't, don't pack your bags. Get out of Dodge now. Woe to you who are with child. Woe to you. I mean, just pray that your flight not be in winter when you've got to escape 
And where are they going to go? They're going to go to the hills. Obadiah chapter 1 teaches a little bit about this. Several other passages. To, uh, and it's called Bozrah in the Bible. Bozrah is the, what we call Petra. Petra is in the country of Jordan. You can see it today. What is God saying? Antichrist, you can take this. You can, what can't you do? Verse 41, you can't touch Edom, Moab, which is that western, or it's not western, eastern plain. It's beautiful. Great uh, grazing, beautiful area up through there. And then there's this really rocky area right in between Israel. There's a, they call it a wadi, which is a deep valley. These, these awesome rock formations. It's all sandstone, huge rock formations. And they will be in that rocky area right along Jordan. And God says, everything will be touched except this one place. Verse 41. Then you go on. Verse 42. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. And he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. Also, the Libyans and Ethiopians shall follow at his heels. So, what happens is Antichrist comes on the scene. God says, you can't touch this area um, where my, the Jewish people have fled. Just like God protected Goshen in the book of Exodus. God protects uh, what is we call Jordan today, where it's a place of refuge for the Jews. Antichrist comes on the scene and he sweeps down to Egypt and he cleans house. How much house does he clean? He cleans gold and silver and all kinds of precious things out of Egypt. He's like, it is time. I'm going to walk away with some Egyptian pounds. And that's their currency. And they're going to walk away with everything that he wants at this time. And so he comes in and Satan is going to pull off. He's going to fund his war machine. Because Satan knows this is still early on. There's still other major players that are going to come into the scene. Well, look in verse 43. He's going to take everything they have. But verse 44, but news from the east and the north shall trouble him. So while he's cleaning house in North Africa, through Egypt and North Africa, all of a sudden word comes to him that the kings of the north up here, and the kings of the east are on the move. Well, we know when that takes place that the river Euphrates is going to dry up and there's going to be a massive army that comes from the east and pours in. The kings of the east can muster up millions of people and we see that there's going to be this massive movement from the kings of the east. Kings of the east would be China and her allies off in that direction. King of the North, I believe, is Russia will be coming down. But look on in your Bible. Just a second. I need to catch up with my notes here. Uh, with In verse, verse 42 and 43, we see that he robs Egypt of her wealth all the way to the eastern border of, uh, border of Libya and the northern border of Ethiopia. So he is going to get all, he's not only going to take Egypt, he's going to go all the way through Egypt. And he's going to swing through here, taking her resources, when all of a sudden he gets all the way out here with his military machine and he hears rumors coming from the north and the east. So as that takes place, verse 44, we see that he will turn himself around and head north. And it says those nations will be at his heels. So Ethiopia and some of North Africa is going to follow back after him a little bit. Egypt's toast. They're gone. They're no longer a thing. But uh, we still have those other military uh, powers behind him. Verse 44, but news from the east and from the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go out with a great fury to destroy and annihilate. He doubles down. Verse 45, and he shall plant the tents of his palaces between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. That's where the temple mounts at. So in Jerusalem, he's going to set up, if you would, what? He's going to set up headquarters. When Jesus comes back, where is he touching down? 
Mount of Olives. Where's Mount of Olives? Just a few hundred feet across from the temple complex. And King Jesus comes down as King of Kings. And notice what it says there. This is all going to happen. He shall come to his end and no more help. There'll be, there's no more help. When Jesus comes back, it's it. And this is where Zechariah chapter 12, verse 2 through 13, 1 comes back, where Jesus comes back and treads out the wine press of the wrath of Almighty God, and where he it smites the nations, and it is over. And all the vultures are invited for the feast. And we see the King of Kings and Lord of Lords steps onto the scene in Revelation 19. And who's with him? Uh, those, the saints, they're dressed in white, fine linen, which is the righteousness of the saints. And we follow and leave right behind King Jesus, who takes care of everything. And we see the end of Joel coming to fruition, the end of Zechariah. And we see numerous of the minor prophets, prophecies that have been foretold for thousands of years. And God keeps his promise to the dot of the exact letters of everything God said. God's going to keep his world. Satan's been whispering to us, where's the promise of his coming? Isn't that what Peter says? People will be saying that. Where's Jesus? He's been promising that he'll come for a long time and he hasn't showed up yet. Oh, why has he not showed up yet? Because the Lord is not slack concerning... Say that again louder. His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward usward. He's a God of grace. There's still some souls that need to be saved in the church age. And then the tribulation. And there'll be souls to be saved in that time out of every tribe and tongue and language around the world. And God will be saving a mighty remnant during that time. All that, we come to this section, and I, I didn't get to share all this, but the disturbing news, the invasion that's going to come to the Middle East is foretold. If you want to match this up, it is uh, the disturbing news of Ezekiel 38 and 39 has taken place. Ezekiel passage says that God revealed that Russia, the land of Magog, will lead a massive military invasion against Israel. Russia and some of its allies will come from the north. Ezekiel 38 verse 6, 15 and 39 2. One of Russia's allies is Persia, we're told from that area. Who's modern day Persia? It's very clearly Iran because Persia was a huge area and Iran is a big area. They're the same location. Iran will be getting involved. Is that surprising to you? By, by the way, no, no, probably not so much. Um, he'll send tr and then we'll send troops from the east. Ezekiel 38.5. The invasion will take place. The restoration of Israel and the homeland. And Israel will feel secure. Ezekiel 38 verse 8. Verse 11 through 14 but only for a period of time. Then we see all that's going to happen in verse 44. When Antichrist hears Israel has been invaded by Russia and her allies, he is going to go forth with great wrath and the goal of annihilating and invading troops in verse 44. Notice, let's go back to verse 44. But news from the east and the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go out with a great fury and destroy and annihilate many. So before he arrives, though, we're told in Ezekiel 38, verse 18 to 30, chapter 39, verse 8, that God will have already destroyed Russia. Magog is going to be totally annihilated. So, Antichrist shows up on the scene. And his enemy's already gone. Crickets. Do you know how weird that is? But if you're a liar and a deceiver, the father of lies, what would you claim in that moment? Look at what I've done. Wouldn't you? If you're a liar, like Satan, Satan's going to take claim for anything and everything he can. He's been taking the credit of God throughout the ages. But that's more in Ezekiel. I know I'm giving you a lot of extra there. And I was reading, I was using that from Reynolds Showers, his wonderful commentary, The Most High God. Um, it's obvious to all the invading force of Russia and her allies will be destroyed supernaturally. And uh, 
uh, we, we see other problems that will ensue as Satan takes credit for various things. He will come to his end and no one will help him. No one's going to be able to deliver him. And I love what Dr. Walton shared. He said his abatement will be without help. Um, and today, our last point, the Antichrist will be characterized as number four, angry, helpless, defeated in the end. The fool has said in his heart there is no God, and Satan is a fool, as in his fight against the Most High God. He will have the tabernacles of his palace. He'll be in Jerusalem. He'll spread his official headquarters, if you will, but he will be terminated. And you know the end of the story in Revelation 19, 11 through 21, where we see that Christ comes back suddenly. And don't you love those passages? In, uh, like, you know what? You all are very familiar with uh, the Revelation 19, but turn to Matthew, would you, for just a second? And we'll end with this. Matthew 25. Twenty-five, thirty-one. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, went, and He will sit on the throne of His glory, and all the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And you will, and you know, the right hand, the left hand, and uh, those that are cast into hell. We see in verse forty and forty-one, which we don't celebrate that but we see him coming with all his glory. Turn back to chapter 24. Chapter 24, verse 26. And he warns them there. Therefore, and he just said that they, if possible, verse 25, that many great signs and wonders and to deceive, if possible, the elect, that's going to be going on for the tribulation period. Why? Because one, he's going to be right in Israel. Verse 26, therefore... If they say to you, look, here, he's in the desert, do not go out. Look, he's in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Here, God's like, my appearing is going to be unlike anything of human proportion when he comes. Verse 30, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Um, and you see that theme repeated throughout the, these two chapters. But I'm going to bring us to a close and as we close, we need to be careful of banking on peace from a world that can only make meager attempts at it. True peace is found only in Jesus Christ. And we need to be ones that say, God, you are the only source of peace, of sanity, and of hope, and of victory this world has ever known. Man is beastly without you. And our hope is not in politicians, in parties, it's not in agendas, it's not in platforms, but it's in Jesus Christ alone. And we need to be careful that we're not deceived. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time that we could be together. Help us, Lord, to learn of you, to love you. Lord, help us to be resting in you. You are the God of hope. You are our great God and Savior. And we look forward to your glorious appearing. The rapture, we look forward to coming back with you at the end in all of your glory and as lightning shoots across the sky we look forward when your splendor is displayed and we with unveiled face behold you in all of your glory Lord this shall be awesome and we look forward to the great day of our God and King the day of the Lord and may you be worshipped in Jesus we pray Amen